So as we, before we even hop into the, the sermon, I want to I wanna make a note about um, one of the announcements. We have our baptism um, celebration coming up at the end of July, July 29th, and we're, we're excited to announce that we're having it at River Park Square in downtown Plymouth at the theater right downtown. We're going to bring out the horse trough. We're going to have it in front. We're going to have a worship service. I'm going to preach a mini sermon, um, if that's possible for me, a mini sermon. I don't know if that's possible. Um, but we're going to celebrate baptism. And, and just to make sure that we're clear on what baptism is and what it's not, baptism is not our way to salvation. It's revealing our salvation. It is an outward expression of an inward change, simply put. It's only an overflow for you to say, look at what Jesus has done in my life. I can't wait to show the world. And it's you saying you want to be identified to the world as a believer, as a Christian, invited into this community with us and to journey with us. And so um, if that is you, if you say, yes, I have been changed, I want everyone to see what Christ has done in my life, you can sign up at the info center. Um, that we'll walk through a class together um, and, and we will talk and, and continue to guide you and disciple, sh- and disciple you um, into the ways of Christ. Um, so if that is you, we would love to celebrate that with you. If you have questions, um, why should I be baptized? I was baptized um, when I was younger, and, and, and it, does that mean that I should be baptized now? All of those kinds of questions, um, find someone. Find me, find someone, and ask those kinds of questions. And, um, and then if that is you, uh, or if it's not you, just anyone in general, what we want to do is leading up to baptism, we want you to send, this is as simple as I can put it, we want you to send a, a video. So literally a selfie video. Um, selfie is where you take your phone and you bring it out in front of you. If, if It's okay if you don't know that. Um, but put it out in front of you or just set up and, and let us know what Jesus has done and is currently doing in your life. Just 30 seconds to one minute. It could be as a family. Um, this is what Jesus has done in our family. Um, and this is what he currently is doing in our family. Or it could just be literally you. Um, and email it to dmorris at plymouth.cc. That's me. Um, and we will use that as a lead up to our baptism celebration. Um, as a way to celebrate the work individually, corporately, of what Christ is doing here at Plymouth Community Church. So um, I would love to see... Um, Monday morning, Tuesday morning, throughout the week, just getting random videos from you in my inbox so I could celebrate with you. Uh, that would be really cool. So um, let's dive in. Let's dive into Galatians uh, 5 here. See, when, when Nick and Jenna um, started transitioning out, uh, uh, Nick, Nick invited me into his office and, and said, this is where you'll be now. Um, I was holed up in a, in a little side office and um, it was bittersweet for me the day that I had a chance to, to move into my new office um, here. If you, if you haven't seen it, it's around the corner, back in the, in the corner. And, um, it was bittersweet. It really was. And I, I had to move things around because it was still Nick's office, and, and I, I missed my brother Nick quite a, quite a bit. And, uh, uh, but what happened was I would get in the rhythm, and I've been in my office for so long, I would um, slowly, as I was walking, maybe re- I can do a lot of things at once, um, I was reading and and doing something, and I just drifted, and I drifted into my old office. Uh, There was nothing in there, guys, like nothing. Um, All my new stuff was in the new office, and so I'm reading this piece of paper from the printer, and so I had to walk straight ahead and then turn, and I'm just drifting, and I walk, literally sit down in my old office chair, and I'm sitting there, and there's nothing. A computer screen, not even a working computer, um, and I sit down, and I look, finally come to myself, and I look and see that there isn't anything there for me anymore. Why am I here? Uh, and so I get up and go back. And over a few period of weeks, um, it just became a normal thing um, to, to dive into my new office. But I had to be aware. I had to fight. I had to actively think, that's not my office. This is my office. No, no, no. Yes. Um, some of you do that if you move to a, a, a new home in, a, in the same community. You know, you go from work. It's just that drive, and you're drifting, and you drive into your old house's driveway and wave to the new buyer because you're in the wrong house, and then b- back out. Some of you do that, but it is that active awareness, that fight to remember this isn't your home. This is your home. There's no life for you there anymore. This is where your life is now. There's nothing for you here anymore. This is where all you need, all you have is found, the new house. And I relate that a lot. And, and this story to the Christian life, to where 
we have to actively fight. We have to actively pursue. We have to remember that there is nothing for us in our old way of life. That there is so much newness and so much hope and so much life in your new life that you've been given in Christ. So remember, fight. That there's nothing for you there and there's everything for you here. And this is what Paul is saying. And, and it's a funny analogy to, to make it uh, lighter. But this is a true fight for our freedom. So where we have to actually, as Christians, think about that there is no life there for you anymore. And you now need to fight for your new life in Christ. And it's an active pursuit, not on your own strength, but in the strength that Christ gives you and through the power of his Holy Spirit. And this is where Paul is going. See, we fight to remember that the truth of God's word trumps the circumstances of your life today. The truth of God's word trumps the circumstances of your life today. You have to fight to remember that. It's an active pursuit. And Paul here in this text Chapter 5, verses 2 through 6 tells us three big concepts that we need to understand. And, and they may sound like fancy words, and I'm not trying to just be fancy for the sake of being fancy. These are important words that we must know as Christians because there's so much depth behind the meaning of them. And there are three big words that we need to make sure that we understand here. And, and, and the first one um, is justification. The second one is adoption. And the third one is sanctification. See, People use this text, especially verse 2 through 6, they use this text to say that you can lose your justification. So let's read it again and see how, how people can read this text without a concept of the knowledge of God and see how they can get here. See, listen, Paul, I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. See, if we didn't know the understanding and didn't have a framework for justification, and Paul previously talked about it in Galatians 3, verses 26 through 29. Let's read it. I think it's up on the screen. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Justified by faith, we are all heirs in Christ. We did nothing to earn it. We did nothing to be known by God. We received the gift of faith by grace in Christ. See, so, so Paul goes there, and not only here in this text, but Romans 8, for I'm, for I'm sure that neither life, death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, we cannot take this text and make it fit what we think is true. We have to use God's word and let it shape how we view God's word. Justification cannot be earned by our works, so it cannot be unearned by our works either. This is the framework that Paul is coming into this text with. And so this is the framework that we need to enter this text with as well. And so when we're going to walk through this text, and there'll be some big picture words, justification, adoption, sanctification. And what I want to try and do is walk through this text and help us dive deeper into theology this morning. Some of you get overwhelmed just by that word, theology, the study of God. I promise you I will land the plane and not just stay ethereal 30,000 feet. I promise you that. So the first term that we need to look at according to this text is justification. Remember the story last week where the northern gentleman showed up to a slave trade back in the, in, in the day. And, and he bought this teenage girl and they were walking and, and the man said, you're free. And the teenage girl said, looked up confused, you mean I'm free to go where I want? And, and he said, yeah. You mean I'm free to say what I want? And he said, yes. To do what I want? Yes. To say whatever I want to say? Yes, he said. And she looked up, over, up at him and said, then I'll stay with you. See, the closer we stay to the one who purchased our freedom, the more free we'll become. The closer we stay to the one who purchased our freedom, the freer we'll become. Justification is a big word that we see here 
all throughout of Galatians. It means it's the gracious act of God by which he declares a sinner righteous solely through faith in Jesus Christ. It's the gracious act of God by which he declares a sinner righteous solely by the act of Jesus Christ. Luther, Martin Luther, the great reformer, said that this doctrine is the church, or is the, the doctrine that the church stands and falls. If we don't understand this, then it's hard to move deeper and deeper into it. See, the, the just judge of the universe bangs the gavel, forgives our sin, and declares us innocent through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is a legal term. Justification is a legal term. Righteous, innocent, imputed to us, given to us. We did nothing. It's an imputed innocence. Given to you innocence is another way to put that. We did nothing. And so we need to understand that we didn't earn it. You don't earn your justification. You receive your justification in Christ. And this, again, remember, we need to take what we know to be true about God's word and not take that out of context, this text here out of context. And so it's an imputed. We were passive. God was active. We weren't really innocent. It was given to us. See, Christ imputes his good deeds, his total obedience, his perfection, his holiness, so that when God sees us, he doesn't see the imperfections, which are many, if you were to be honest with yourself. He sees the perfection of Christ and declares us innocent. And see, this is the first component that we need to understand. As we read verses 2 through 4, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you. See, if if you were saved by Jesus, but now it's time for you to get to work, Jesus is just your moral example, is what Paul is saying, not your total Savior. If you were saved by grace through faith in Christ, and now you have this mindset that it's time for you to get to work to save yourself, Jesus is just your moral example, not your total Savior. Because Jesus is either your everything or is your nothing. This is how we have to read this text. It's how we have to see this text. See, when it comes to the gospel, when we talk about the gospel here, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, we've been saying that time and time again. When it comes to the gospel, every addition is really a subtraction. When it comes to the gospel, every addition is really a subtraction. It's not Jesus plus something, then you can have it. It's Jesus plus nothing equals everything here. See, Paul is saying that if you are justified by the law, then you're required to keep the whole thing. And so nobody does this. So when we take the truth of what we know to be true about God, our theology, and we let it dictate the text, we then can have a full understanding of this text. When we talk about justification or the act of being justified, we then can now dive into adoption. And see, this is where it gets exciting for me because it is a real um, life example. I don't have to look far to come up with an analogy of adoption in my world. Um, If you don't know my wife... Aaron and I are in the process of adopting our two uh, beautiful babies in which we, uh, we've been in foster care for two and a half years right now. And, um, and we're finalizing adoption, hopefully in the next 30 to 45 days. And we could not be more excited to, to do this. And so here's what I, how I want to talk about adoption. Because this is, we have to understand these things in order to understand this text rightly. So bear with me. So God is not only the just judge of the universe, which he is. He declares us innocent. He's also our heavenly father who delights in us, who finds joy in you personally, wherever you're at. See, I know this is hard for us to understand God as our father. We can see God as our creator. We can see God as our judge, but it's hard because there's some daddy issues in the room today. We, We grew up in a household in which your dad didn't make you feel cherished or loved or parental issues in this place today where where your dad would say ask me again and it wasn't an invitation and it was a threat ask me again i dare you ask me again it wasn't that's not an invite that was a threat growing up so it's hard for you to understand god is the one who says ask me again ask me again please come to me ask me again i'm here i'll hear you so i understand that this is hard for us to to think about to have this picture of adoption but this picture of adoption is not Not only is it legal, it's what makes our God so personal. It's what makes our God so personal 
See, where the doctrine of justification makes us right before God the judge, adoption tells us that we are loved by God the Father. Legally justified, adoption personally loved. See, how we can view this is justification is a legal term, and it's impersonal. It's an impersonal legal term. The judge not only declares you innocent, but he also, in adoption, this is how we view it. He gets down from this seat, from the bench, goes to you wherever you're seating, wherever you're sitting, puts his arm around you, takes off your shackles, and says, come home, dear child, let's have some fun. That's adoption. Come home, dear child, let's get a meal. So that same judge who declares you innocent, not only declares you innocent legally, he now gets down off his bench, puts his arm around you, takes the shackles off, and says, let's go get a good meal. Are you hungry? This is how we have to view adoption. See, J.I. Packer says, to be right with God is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God is an even greater thing. To be right with God is a great thing, but to be loved and cared for by God is an even greater thing. Packer tells us that when he was asked what it means to be a Christian, he says this, if you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much they make of the thought of being God's child and having God as a father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls their worship and prayers and their whole outlook on life, it means they do not understand Christianity very well at all. See, I've sat through a lot of court hearings, guys, two and a half years of court hearings, and I I think some of you, I'm not ignorant enough, to think that some of you haven't done this either. Many court hearings where the judge bangs the gavel, we get the hearing started, and and he lists off numbers, JC 503017, and then another subsequent number. And, And those numbers represent my babies. See, the judge in justification is that impersonal person. But the adoption makes it the personal so when he's naming off these numbers i'm in my mind saying that's my lukey (laughs) call him lucas lukey lukey we'll go down the list for you for nicknames then he names names the next number that's my sweet emma girl he doesn't see them as that he doesn't know the color of their eyes he doesn't know the color of their hair he doesn't know them he's only knowing them by the number in their case but then when the dad is sitting and listening you know what the dad is thinking Those are my babies. It's hard for us to understand that that's how God views us. Isn't it? Not only the just judge, not only the legal impersonal, but the personal who has your hair's numbered. Who you're not just a number to him. You are a personal being. He knows your eyes. He knows your smile. He knows your thoughts. He knows you inside and out, and he loves you. It's hard for us to understand that. Because we take what's our circumstantially true in our life and we place it on God. What I want to challenge us to do is take what we know to be true about God in his word and let that dictate how we view our circumstances. So the nature of our relationship with God is that we've been justified and declared innocent, but then we've been called sons and daughters, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. Paul tells us in 329 that we are heirs, and that happened instantly. The moment you gave up, the moment you gave up trying to justify yourself is the moment you received Christ. And it happened instantly. Justified and adopted by faith in Christ. The moment you gave up and said, God, I give up, show me. Please show me. I want more of you. Give me faith. The moment you did that, the moment that you received Christ is the moment you were justified and the moment you were adopted. Instantly. It wasn't like you were justified and then God put a, an, a, something around your, your ankle as a probationary period. Some, some of you know what I'm talking about, house arrest. An ankle, put it around your ankle and, and then he'd go, all right, here's this period for you. You prove to me that you are a good little boy, a good little girl, and, and then I'll invite you in my home. I, we didn't do that with Emma and Luke. We just invited them in and loved on them. And that moment that, they, that, God, that you show up to God's door and, and you say, I give up, I want more of you. Jesus, please, I, I beg you, let me in. And, and Christ, 
in his grace and his mercy lets you in and invites you in and pulls you in. That moment that you receive Christ is the moment that he says you're adopted. You're not just justified, you're adopted. You're known by me. I love you. Come in and let's get a meal. So we have to understand this text is not saying that we can lose any of that. If you confess true faith in Christ. My wife and I, as we, as we look to this near future, when the judge bangs the gavel, he is declaring that Emma and Luke are not only legally no longer wards of the state, but they're Morris's. And that's not just legal, y'all, that's personal. And that's how God views you. It's not just this impersonal, distant deity. It's the heavenly Father who loves you, who knows you. And if it takes my analogy of my real life right now for that to get across to you, I'm going to use it all day long. See, when we understand that God is not just a just judge who declares us innocent in Christ, that he is our heavenly father. It changes the way we view this text because no matter where I go, no matter where Emma goes, no matter where Luke goes, no matter where your daughters and sons, wherever you go, you're still a mom or a dad because you have a daughter and a son. And the same is true for us. You have a father in heaven. No matter where you go, you have a father. No matter how far you run, you have a father who loves you. See, this is what Paul is saying here is that, again, I declare, verse 3, every man who lets himself be circumcised, that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Paul is saying, why would you ever do that to yourself? Verse 4, you who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Why would you ever do that is the, the connotation that Paul has here. Why would you ever do that to yourself? It's like that slave girl, the teenage slave girl, running and saying, I'm free Okay, I'm going to run back to my slavery now. I'm going to run back to my slave, uh, my owners now. You're no longer owned by them. I bought you with a price, is what Jesus is telling us, what God is telling us in Christ. See, not only that, guys, uh, God doesn't just want us to understand these two big things. He wants us to understand that, that not only are we positionally holy, and when God looks down on us, because of Christ, track with me, imputed righteousness, given to us holiness we didn't earn it we don't deserve it it's reckless love because that is true he not only wants positional holiness he wants transformational holiness he wants to change your life right now and this is what paul is saying in verse 5 for through the spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope see he's not just after positionally holy he's after manifest holiness transformational holiness today and and it's it's hard for us to get our mind around that we are positionally holy but it's even harder for us to to think about that he wants us to grow and never stop changing today see it is not saved by grace alone in christ alone to get into the christian life and then your work begins Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, every day of every week, of every minute, of every second of every day. We don't move on from grace. We just dive deeper into it. That's how we're changed. See, it's saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, every minute of every day. Paul is saying in verse 2 and in verse 4, I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you, or in verse four, that you have been severed from Christ, alienated from Christ, split from Christ. And what he's saying there is that you now have no power to change. Sure, church, Galatians, you people, sure you've been saved, but you have no power to change because you're resting in your own works. See, I say this often and it just fits that God doesn't just want the end of your life Although that is true. Oh, that is true. Don't hear me say that's not true. But God wants your life right now. And he wants to change your life right now. And some of you need to hear that it's not Jesus plus your work that's going to get transformation. It's Jesus plus nothing is going to get you into everything. And that your work resting and your work is what you think you can bank on. And Paul is saying that's not true. You can't. See, 
God doesn't just want the end of your life. He wants your life right now. Don't go back to your old office. There's nothing for you. Don't pull up in somebody else's driveway anymore. There's nothing there for you. You have a new life now. The new life is found in me, is what God is saying. And then verse 5. Paul tells us here how, how this transformation happens through the Spirit. We eagerly await the hope of righteousness. And that leads to our last term here, which is sanctification. Not just positionally holy, transformational holiness. Sanctification, the transforma transformation happens through sanctification, that we are justified and we are adopted right in that moment. But after the moment of conversion, true conversion, all out Christianity, Jesus plus nothing equals everything, you are now instantly being sanctified. And that takes grace-based obedience. And I'm saying obedience in church this morning, y'all. And I'm all for grace. I'm all for the freeness in Christ. But following that, it does take a grace to be received by the Holy Spirit to grow. Just like a flower is planted and you have to tend to it, we have to tend to our hearts by grace, through faith, by what verse 5 says, for through the Spirit, through the Spirit, we eagerly await, passionately await. Paul in 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. And where does it come from? Which comes from the Lord. And who is the Lord? Who is the Holy Spirit? Apart from the Holy Spirit's work in your life, we have no power to change. Apart from you receiving the Holy Spirit through Christ and resting in that every day, day by day, transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. And who are we looking to? The Lord's glory. And who is the Lord's glory fully revealed in? Jesus. Apart from that every day, the Holy Spirit working in you, we have no hope. But if we are resting through the Spirit, eagerly awaiting the faith of righteousness, which is what Paul is saying we're doing, then we will change. See, sanctification does take grace-driven effort. It means we move towards the thing. See, let's make this clear that verse 5 tells us those who are eagerly awaiting the return of the Lord, the hope of righteousness. That means for those who are believers. If you are not a believer, you are not being sanctified. If you're not a believer, you're not being saved. In your pursuit of self-betterment, you are simply running full speed to the wrong thing. Sure, you may better yourself. You're not sanctifying yourself. Sanctification belongs to the children of God. Growing in knowledge of Christ belongs to the children of God. So Christianity is not our best life now. Christianity is our best life to come. In fact, Jesus will make your life more difficult now. Hear me. Jesus will make your life more difficult right now. He'll make you light in a dark world, and, and he'll make you really uncomfortable. And a real Christian is one who eagerly awaits for their best life because they know it's not found in this world. We know it's found in the day to come. A Christian is one who longs for the day when they'll finally be rid of their half-hearted desires for Jesus and love him with a whole heart. See, Ray Ortland says it like this, do you want a dead church? Do you want a hypothetical savior? Do you want grace in your doctrine but hell in your experience? Then go ahead and give in to your anxieties. Go ahead and believe that Jesus gets you 99% of the way home, but at that last 1% is where you have to prove yourself. You want a dead church? You want a hypothetical savior? Go ahead and give in thinking that Jesus got you 99% of the way and you have to earn your 1%. 1%. How does it work? Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 tells us that we need to put off and put on. So let's read it. Ephesians 4, if you have your word, turn there with me. Starting in verse 22. <clears throat> you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You have to actively think that this office isn't yours anymore. You have to actively think on and pursue that your new home is not in this driveway. It's a new address that you are put in. Your stuff isn't there anymore. Your life is now here. To actively think about that. See, while growing in our knowledge of the Lord, renewing our mind, 
we are putting to death what is sinful in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, we don't try and tame our sin. We don't put it in a cage and say, you behave now. We don't put a leash around a lion and say, this is my pet. That's why they have that show when animals attack. Because people think they can tame a lion. You can't tame a lion. It's going to get you eventually. That's why they made a show about it, and we, are, we enjoy it. Because why? Why do we laugh at it? Because we, we know the lion's going to attack. <laughs> we know it's going to get you eventually. You don't make a pet with a lion. You stay away from it. And if it's coming at you, you go into survival mode. And you kill it. <laughs> Sorry for you pet lovers out there. You lion lovers, I'm, I don't mean to offend you. Luke, my, my Lucas would be very mad at me if I ever say that because of Lion King. We don't make pets with a lion. We don't make pets with our sin. We kill it. That's sanctification. See, we can't do this alone. We can't do this alone. We need people around us to tell us that making a pet with a lion is a good idea because at our worst, we would think that making a pet with a lion is a great idea. Come on, it's cute. Look at Simba. We need people to tell us, yo, that's not a good idea. Don't do that. It's really not a good idea. Don't do that. No, seriously, it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Give me your wallet. You're not going to buy that. We need people. We need community. We can't grow in isolation. We need people to tell us that it's worth fighting for. We need people in the car next to us to say, that's not your address anymore. This is where your address is found, and it's in Christ. We need people around us to tell us that. Because at our worst, we forget. And this is what happens when we are growing in Christ and we are understanding this. Verse 6 happens. Look at verse 6. For in Christ, Jesus For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith. It's expressing itself through love. The only thing that matters is your faith that leads you to love. We're not called to be comfortable. We're not called into a life of ease. We're called into a life of love. It's iron sharpening iron. And let's look at that. When, when metals are hitting each other and sharpening one another, what's happening? What's coming off? Stuff. Dead stuff. Dead baggage. All of it. Sparks are flying. It's a violent process. It isn't comfortable. This is why we actually avoid community because it's not comfortable. It's not easy. It's why in really, really big churches... People can just show up and sit and not be known and then hear a good, encouraging sermon and leave. Because it's easy. You just kind of come and hang out and be encouraged by some songs in a sermon and, and, and then leave. It's comfortable. And y'all, I don't want to be comfortable. I want to grow in Christ. And that's not comfortable. And this is what Paul is saying here. There's more for you than that. It's faith working through love, which is the most powerful force in this world has ever known. It is God's kingdom strategy. Faith working through love is God's kingdom strategy. How will they know that we are Christ's disciples? By how we love one another. You can't love one another by yourself at home around a dinner table. On his blog, Scott Sauls, which is one of my favorite pastors, if you haven't read him or, or seen him, look him up, Scott Sauls. He had a guest writer, and and Jeff Hayes was his name, and and he wrote this. Unlike Christianity that offers free gifts of salvation to any race, any color, any creed, to anyone that believes, most religions require that you earn salvation through good works. And I'm way too much of a screw-up to to make that cut. But what if I'm wrong about God and Jesus and the truth that there is really no creator? What if I'm wrong? How does that play out in my life? The way I see it, I will waste my time serving a non-existent God whose fake philosophy is based on love. A non-existent God whose fake book tells me that my life should be about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A God whose principles will make me a better man, make me a better husband, make me a better father and friend, regardless of whether or not he is real. I also get to believe that my death, at my death, I have an eternal life in paradise. I literally have 
Everything to gain, nothing to lose. Listen to me. If your Bible reading, if your theology leads you to be a harder person to be around, a more critical person, a more selfish person, a more bitter person, a a more insensitive person, you are reading your Bible wrong and you have a wrong view of God, our Heavenly Father. If your Bible reading allows you to become a harder person in general, not a softer, not a more sensitive, not, a, not living a life of peace, of joy, of kindness, of most of all love, because it, what Paul is telling us and what he says consistently is that our life, what matters most in our life is our love. So if we're reading our Bible and becoming a harder person, I would challenge us that we're reading the Bible wrong. And I'd love to have a chat with you. <laughs> How will this hurting, broken world See, the love of Christ is by the love of Christ through you. What will reveal our faith in this hurting and broken world is how we love this hurting and broken world. See, because we're eagerly awaiting for this day where our faith will no longer be an invisible faith, but a true visible faith. See, we're not going back to our old home. We don't live there anymore. There's nothing for us there is what Paul is saying. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. So worship team, I invite you up as we end with this, that Christianity is not about not sinning. We don't celebrate simply because the the cancer is gone, but because health is returning. New life is returning. Christianity is about seeing Jesus in his glory and being glorified by the mere sight of him. A Christian is not someone who's learning to tame their sin. A Christian is someone learning how to kill their sin. You actually become more aware of its strategy in your life and you actually seek to kill it and realize that that sin was paid for by the finished work of Jesus on the cross and whose future is now secure, the eternal hope of righteousness where that sin, that presence of sin, that stench of sin will no longer be there. See, my question today is not whether or not you receive this hope. I, I hope you have. I hope you do. But it's where do you need to start fighting? Fighting to run to life and not death. Where do, you, where do you personally, as you call yourself a Christian, as those who've received Christ, where do you need to think on and, and look to, to fight, to not run to death, but to run to freedom and life and hope, not slavery? What do you need to expose in the light? What lion are you trying to make a pet with in your life? See, Jesus allows us to live in the light, to expose the deep corners, the the hidden things, the secret sins in our life. He wants you to bring that to light so it can be killed. It's in your isolation that it eats you from the inside out. It's that lion that is caged, but all along had a strategy to get the, the, the kennel open. See, where are you choosing to live in isolation instead of community? Who will fight with you? Who will encourage you if you're by yourself? This church exists to glorify Christ. That it is Jesus plus nothing equals everything. And the only way we can do this in our community is live in a life of radical, sacrificial, honest, transparent love. See, Paul is saying this, and this is what I want you to get. If you walk away from anything with this small chunk of text, it's this. If you add one ounce to Jesus, you lose the full weight of Jesus. If you add one ounce to Jesus, you lose the full weight of Jesus. Let's be a church that rests fully in Christ together. So as we sing this last song, reflect on these lyrics that we are singing, that we are lifting up to God, that it is God who brings life. It's God who brings love. It's God who brings light in the darkness and hope and restoration for every one of us. And that right there is available to every one of us today. To live free, to no longer go back to your old office, to go to a brand new office that's better than you ever could imagine. Let me pray for us and we'll continue in worship. Father, we love you. Come to you asking you to do this work in us, Holy Spirit, to preach a better sermon than I ever could. For those who need to hear that we've been bought with a price, Jesus, that you bought us, you loved us, you pursued us, that you died the death that we deserve. You didn't stay in the grave, you rose and conquered it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that 
same Holy Spirit can now be in us, through us, out of us, the power to live new lives, to fight together. I pray that this church would be desperate, a desperate church for you, Jesus, that we wanna see you restore every corner, every nook and cranny of this community, that where there is death, we would bring life because of the death and life that you brought in us, that you made us new, Jesus. I pray that we would hear that. I pray that we would reflect on that. I pray that we would never move on from that. Let us worship you and you alone, Christ. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's worship.